Hi, welcome to Life on the Rock. And tonight as our guest, we have the Benedictine monks from St. Benedict's Abbey. We have Father Abbot James Albers, Brother Levin Harton, and Father Meinrad Miller joining us to talk about uh, Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas, and of course, the Benedictines there. And uh, we're happy to have them. They're doing great work. We've had a number of guests that come through the college here on the show, so we're glad to, to get the heart behind that, uh, yeah. those guests. So yeah. good to see you, Doug. Good to you, Padre. Uh, a lot going on. Anything going on in your world these days? Yeah, actually, here we are in the middle of the summer, mm -hmm. and uh, we are setting up our Battle Ready Rally Tour schedule for the fall and into 2015. And I want anybody out who's interested to come to our website, battlereadystrong.com, 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 in case you didn't get the first two times. <laughs> And, uh, and, and just hook up with us on this. You know, we're gonna be in Florida in September. We're, we got about 12 days down there. We got a couple still to fill. Uh, we're gonna be in uh, Illinois for seven or eight days in October. We're gonna be in Louisiana in the end of August. Um, We've got uh, looking into Wisconsin. Uh, we're, we're talking to Dave, uh, Bishop David Ricken up there, uh, and just several other places around the country. Um, so please, you know, go to our website battlereadystrong.com in case you didn't get the first three times. Mm -hmm. And uh, check out the event page, give us a call, connect with us, or set up a, a tour in your area. Why Battle Ready Rallies? You know, because as we talk about a lot on the show, is it, it is a spiritual fight, and that's what the Battle Ready Rallies are all about. They're talks to rally people together. We try to bring prayer, we bring prayer in it, we try to bring confessions if we can, and exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. We need deeper prayer. We need hearts that are motivated and set on fire for God. We're gonna talk to three men tonight who obviously clearly have that, that zeal um, and they've, they've taken that path and, and gone that route into the spiritual warfare of being um, you know, monks in, in today's day and age. So you know, we're gonna talk about Benedict. We're gonna talk about the history of our church and how it's always been this battle between people rising up, as we were talking before the show started, mm -hmm. leaders have a lust for power and they wanna destroy good and holy things out there such as the church, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got the good people that God raises up like a Saint Benedict in his time and you, the viewer and listener right now and us here, He's trying to raise up now to be today's warriors and fighters for what is good, holy, and true. And it isn't something ever to be taken lightly because we know the consequences are eternal and they're very, very serious. Right. So uh, yeah, that's what we're, we're always focused on the battle of us. And they're growing uh, by the grace of God, they're growing. We're, we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of traction with them. I like God. that image of you traveling across the country and you're a great traveler. You do it uh, tirelessly. Oh, thank you and uh, you know, to, to gather people together because the church in our deepest reality is a communion, right? It's mm -hmm. a fellowship and, right. and we're united. We're not saved as individuals without bond or link as Vatican II says, we're saved as members of the mystical body of Christ. You know, Pope Francis recently in, a, in a, an audience talks about this theme and he refers to said in the Old Testament, you know, they had this gathering of a people uh, through Abraham, right, and the patriarchs, and then after the Exodus event, you know, the, the giving of the law, the gathering of the people to worship God, and, uh, and all that's brought to a new fullness in Jesus Christ, that we are united in Him, in His mystical body. And he says, our relationship, he says, you know, the, the faith is given to us by people that have gone before us in the faith, family, friends, whoever, saints, church. He said, but we are Christians not only because of others who have given us the faith, but together with others. Our relationship with Christ is personal, but not private. It is born of and enriched by the communion of the church. Our shared pilgrimage is not always easy. At times we encounter human weakness, limitations, and even scandal in the life of the church. Yet God has called us to know him and to love him precisely by loving our brothers and sisters, by persevering in the fellowship of the church, and by seeking in all things to grow in faith and holiness as members of the one body of Christ. Oftentimes today, it's nothing new, but we hear it more and more frequently, 
that, you know, I believe in God, I, I'm a spiritual person, but I don't need the church. Mm -hmm. I don't need this body of believers. Well, we do. The reality is, when we're united with Christ, we're united with his body and with others. And we need that. We need to live out of that reality. We need to foster that reality. God gives us grace uh, through others, we could say, in a loose sense, and that he's, he's there. Uh, we're witnessed to by others. We're encouraged by others, strengthened by others. And uh, we have to manifest that right. reality to the world. And that is so compelling for people in terms of evangelization. We hear it literally every week here on Life on the Rock that people are drawn to this communion, this sense of belonging, this sense of family that the gospel is supposed to give and that they see, right? That is so often uh, some aspect of someone's story is that, you know, I just felt like I belonged. You know, we heard it last week mm -hmm. with Christ in the city. Uh, the young man said, you know, this group looked at him in a different way, All right. you know, so all right. we need to spread that. Well, we do, we do yeah, and, and it is exactly what we're all about. We, mm -hmm. we have a deep longing to be part of something greater than ourselves, mm -hmm. bigger than ourselves, that is good and holy and noble. Right. And, uh, and it's written on our hearts. It's written in our spiritual DNA, if you want to mm -hmm. call it that. Um, it's innate. It's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the devil's very good at setting up those traps and those snares to try to divide and isolate. And, uh, and, and draw you away from what, what the, the body of, of, of Christ, the body of believers that God has right. uh, structured us for. Right. And that can lead to loneliness, despair, emptiness, desolation, uh, and all sort of other right. um, problems that flow right. from that. And our Holy Father also talks about this, this sense of mission that we have and that we're called not to just achieve a task, but there's also, we're called to enter into a process, a process of purification, a process of discernment, a process of obedience, a process of prayer. And, and we need to be faithful to this process. And as Doug mentioned, you know, it's just a struggle, there's difficulties, but you know, it's not just achieving something, it's also growing inwardly mm -hmm. in, our, in our walk with God and in holiness. So yeah. a lot to think about. We're gonna have a great show for you tonight. Uh, yeah. The monks are gonna share with us uh, a little bit of history of St. Benedict and and their spirituality and the great work they're doing out in Kansas. So don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to Life on the Rock. I'm Doug Barry, along with uh, Father Mark. We are the co-hosts, the Rock House Compadres, we like to say, and you're at the uh, Rock House right now. Thanks for being with us tonight. We have the uh, wonderful uh, privilege of having these gentlemen from uh, Atchison, Kansas, uh, Benedictine Monastery down there. Gentlemen, we have uh, Abbot James Albers and Father Meinrad and Brother Levin. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Distant fist bump there. All right. Thanks for being on the show with us tonight. Yeah. Thank, thanks for having us. This is fantastic. I love these types of shows because I know there's a lot of people out there flipping channels and they're going to come across this and they're going to see these four gentlemen sitting here all in these robes and they go, oh, it's just a religious show and this and that. But, but that's why I like to say, okay, let's get, let's get into some real, real dirt about the world. And what I mean by that is the first segment we talked about the fact that we've this constant struggle, history of man, of of people rising up with lust for power, trying to destroy what is good. And then you've got God raising up those who were battling back. And in most recent years, we have a, a Saint John Paul II who took on the communists in Poland and, and dealt with, you know, Russia and some of this stuff. And, and, mm -hmm. and you've got uh, all the way back to your uh, patron, Saint Benedict, back in the, what, fifth, sixth century time period. I mean, what a phenomenal history that our church has of heroes, giants, who have been involved, thickly engaged in this battle of good and evil in this world. You know, I travel around, I talk about Revelation 12, where, where the, after the war in heaven broke out, and the demons were thrown out of heaven. And I ask people a lot of times in my battle ready rallies, where were they thrown to? 95% of people say they were thrown into hell and they don't realize they were thrown to earth and that we're living in this, this uh, <clears throat> moment that we all have in our brief history, that, you know, our, our, our breath in this world of, of real, serious battle. 
And you gentlemen come from a long line of serious warriors being Benedictines because of Benedict himself. So um, I'd like to start, if we could, and have they all just kind of pitch in, first of all, about the history of St. Benedict and a little bit about the order. Let's kind of establish that for the audience so they understand where we're coming from. Sure. You know, St. Benedict really answered a call, a need of, of his time. Um, Rome was in the, in the process of chaos. I mean, it, it was just really crumbling um, at its very core. And so St. Benedict, as a student there in Rome, um, felt he needed to get out of that, that situation. So he fled and was a hermit for three years and, and really understood then that, okay, it, he needed to do more for the world. He needed to do more to, to raise up Christ um, for others to see. And, and so... And about what year would this have been when he, when he flees Rome to go out into the world? It's about year 500. 500. So he was born in 480. Um, okay. And so he would have been in his early studies okay. in Rome. All right. So he's a young man like, like a typical college age guy would be yeah. today, right? Yeah. Maybe a guy named Kevin sitting in the audience right now who's 23 years old maybe and, and feels this, oh, there he is right there, and feels this call on his heart to go out and do something for the church. And so Benedict, the same sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, so he's out in the wilderness and things got a little crazy for him though. Um, Father, can you pick up on that? Well, he was uh, asked by a group of monks to come be their abbot, but the problem was they really didn't want an abbot. They wanted to sort of live a corrupt life so after a while, they tried to poison him. They put poison in his wine, but as a good Catholic, he blessed it before he received it, and the cup cracked and a snake came out. So he took that as a sign that that was the end of his being abbot there. So he went back to living in solitude, and then that wasn't much better because there was a jealous priest. Some people think that he was a heretical priest, and he was jealous because St. Benedict was drawing people to believe in Christ. So he sent him a loaf of poisoned bread and so St. Benedict had his pet raven take the bread out into the wilderness. That's why we're the Benedictine College Ravens today, our mascot, because the raven saved his life. And I always think that it probably cut down on the squirrel population because they <laughs> ate the poison bread. But other than that, he was pretty good. But. Now, for those people who might think, you know, and there are those out there who think that priests just kind of had this kind of timid appeal and so forth. This is a man who had his own pet raven. That's and right. That, that's kind of an odd pet to have around. You know? It was like Elijah in the Old Testament, because you remember Elijah received the right. food from the raven. So right. Benedict also had this raven who would help him and, and certainly got rid of the poison bread. So that was a good thing. So what, what is it like to, to think that you're, you're the founder of your order um, your patron is, uh, is a man who attempted assassinations on his life by fellow priests even. Well, <laughs> it, it, it's got to make you all feel good here. <laughs> look, it sounds sort of like the uh, Christ because he himself was betrayed by Judas. Right. And so, right. so Christ gives us an example that it's, it's not a very good, uh, if you're looking for a secure life, it's not a very good job security because someone's going to try to kill you. We, we haven't tried to poison Abbot James yet. So we're, <laughs> We're, 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 we're. All right, that's good. That's good. He's got his little, you know, college right. students kind of rotate as your little that's wine right. testers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I've only been at this year and a half, so <laughs> we've we got time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Billy, try my bread first, please, and uh, my salad. And, uh, okay, so so this is, and I think about this with the, the whole idea of that that would have been scandalous at the time, you know, if CNN or Fox News or any of these guys would have been around back then. You know, if that would have hit the news, but it would have been scandal in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. monks tried to kill Abbott. Yeah, exactly, yeah, it would have been big. But the yeah. biggest scandal ever, and I think we need to remember this, you know, as Catholics especially, is, is that, whenever the, you, the, these things are thrown at the church, is how terrible and scandalous is. Nothing, nothing would have beat the supposed scandal of what happened on Calvary. Oh, yeah. You know, the fact that uh, they could have been there reporting with Jesus hanging on the cross saying, here he is. And, and of his 12, one turned him in and he hung himself and the others have run and only one is here, this young guy here who obviously doesn't know any better. You know, I mean, it could have been a horrible thing, but Christ himself knew mm -hmm. by even choosing Judas that this is what this was all about. Was this not maybe to remind us and set us up that, you know, you're in this world and you've got something to deal with here. And uh, you got to be strong, you know, not a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of, 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 of a fire and, and, and you know, a fire breathing John the Baptist, you know, to get out there and really take this to the world. And that's really what the Benedictines kind of started out as, right? Yeah, uh, St. Benedict um, in his rule talks about how there's going to be culture, there's going to be people gathering around the monastery. And so he, he knew from the beginning that, that there was a responsibility to bring Christ to those people. And, and, and even St. Benedict saw that those people that came to the monastery were Christ himself. 
And so there was that, that beautiful interchange of, of bringing Christ to, to those in need, and, but then also recognizing that they bring Christ to us. And right. so that just the, 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 the context of that is, is incredible. We spoke earlier about how Monte Cassino is a very, very tall uh, hill in, in, the, in, in the region of Italy. So uh, St. Benedict raises up the monastery to be a beacon, to be a city on a hill, to be uh, an example to the surrounding area. Um, and as Abba James, uh, I think, mentioned earlier as well, just uh, St. Benedict says that the, the monastery will, never, will not be without guests. So mm -hmm. there was an expectation that people would come to be revitalized by what they found at the monastery and then go back out. And in the process, we ourselves would find Christ, as Abbot James said, mm -hmm. a beautiful link. Mm -hmm. So you gentlemen have all come to this. Now, I'd like to go down just and ask each one of you um, just a little bit about your, your, your past. And Abbot, since you are the, the superior <coughs> okay. of the monastery there in Atchison, if you could just tell us, the audience, what brought you to being sick. I, I think some people just think, well, these sure. guys were obviously born this way, you sure. know, and <laughs> they, they, get the, they get the robe, you know, he gets the brown one, they get the black ones, and they just yeah. go that route. But you're young men, you're growing up, you're like so sure. many other men going mm -hmm. through life, and then somewhere in this, God puts on your heart in one way or another. And I know Father Mark's story, he was, a, he was an engineer in college and a, and, a, and competitive swimmer and so forth, and now he sits, uh, you know, in, in, entrenched in the battle for souls in his way and your foxholes in Kansas to fight from. What brings you to the foxhole in Kansas? Sure, I actually uh, grew up in the shadow of the monastery in one of our parishes. So my pastor growing up was a Benedictine monk. And um, when it came time for college, um, I wanted to uh, be at an institution that fostered my faith because I, I felt at that early time in high school uh, that I might be called to uh, the priest or religious life. And so I wanted to go to a place. So I went to Benedictine College and um, just really uh, was a wonderful experience, but at that time I uh, didn't um, feel that that was where God was calling me. So I worked a year and a half as, in, as a communications editor. Um, and uh, Father Miner was actually the vocations director at the time. And I've shared this story with him, but he invited me up, kind of pestering me, just you need to come up for a visit, you need to come back to the campus. And really more to get him off my back, I came back for a weekend. I was and, the future Abbots. And, right. uh, and, and you knew that because a raven had told you this was supposed that's to be. Right. That's right, 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 yeah. So a piece uh, of bread. Yeah. an act to get him off my back, it got me to the monastery. There you go. So, Wow, but, incredible. Uh, that, so, was, that was 19 years ago. So, so really, it, for you, it wasn't some oh, moment necessarily no. as much as it was, a, okay, all right, all right. Yeah. The persistence of yeah. mm -hmm. another human being. So God working through ordinary means and the persistence yeah. of this priest. Yeah, and really from a young age, the Benedictines were what I knew. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was a natural movement uh, uh, progress yeah. in that direction. So, so 19 years now. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Father, how about you? What's your story? I came to Benedictine College in 83 and uh, I was a music major there and after two years I was looking at a lot of different orders but what really appealed to me about the Benedictines was the community prayer and the apostolates because we have the college, high school, parishes because I wanted to do something where I both had prayer, community, that communion that we've talked about earlier in the show that's so important and so not just to be a, a, a lone ranger but to be with a group of men and to be in an apostolate together. So the, the Abbey really attracted me. So after my sophomore year of college, I joined the Abbey and have been a monk for 29 years now. So in fact, this July 10th will be, um, the, the, uh, this, this week is the 29th anniversary of my receiving the habit. So. Yeah. so it's a Congratulations. Very, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, so That's fantastic. Did they get a, a great big cup of wine and a piece of bread for you as a well, celebration? Uh, I, just as long as I can uh, pray and have a raven standing by. <laughs> Brother, what's your story? Yeah, um, well, I, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, when, I, when I give my vocation story, I, I mentioned to people that I, I, n I never thought about being a religious a priest ever, ever, ever growing up. This was not in my, uh, in my hori on my horizon in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I, I went through Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, uh, but as I, as, I, as I was going on in my junior high years, my high school years, um, I found a lot, of, a lot of other ways of living that appealed to me a lot more than what I felt like my faith was, which was a set of rules and a set of kind of a, kind of a Catholic culture without the encounter with Christ in prayer and the sacraments. 
Um, so, so I got, when yeah. When you say other ways, sorry to interrupt, but you say other ways, you mean um, just lifestyles, uh, job, career, just uh, yeah, yeah. comfort, uh, security, uh, other, other owning a goods. casino, I mean, what, what would it have yeah. been? <laughs> <laughs> owning a casino, if I could have, I, I don't think I had that opportunity. <laughs> a um, casino came to mind, I don't yeah, know. No, <laughs> no um, just popularity, drinking, um, dating, uh, partying, right. the, the various things ways in, in high school. The ways of the world. The ways of the world, yeah, okay. in general, yeah. All the, all the things that are good that, that um, get out of bounds when we uh, rely on them instead of Christ, when right. we make them Christ. So. Um, I got to college and I went to Benedictine College for a variety of kind of incidental factors. And, um, and just while I was there, I recognized at some point in time that I wasn't happy and that I couldn't secure my own happiness. That was the crucial thing, that I couldn't secure my own happiness. I wasn't able to do that for myself. And uh, because I recognized that on some level, for the first time in my life, even though I went to Catholic school, even though I went you know, to, to Mass on Sundays for a while at least, um, I got on my knees and I prayed the rosary every day for a summer and it, and it just changed my life because by the end of the summer what I recognized was that there was a person who was near me and to whom my actions mattered, everything that I did mattered. And that's different from, from me understanding that I'm, I'm being bad when I do these things. Um, the difference is that there's a person with me and my actions mattered. So I began to pray and everything began to change in my life. The values that I held, um, the way that I uh, interacted with people, um, the things that I did, the things that I sought. And by the time I got to my senior year at Benedictine College, recognizing that um, in the monastic life, we stayed in one location, we stayed at this place that had given me my faith, I decided that I wanted to be there for good. Um, so I entered formation in 2006. Yeah. I, the one thing that stood out with everything you just said that I think resonates with most of us in the audience probably, I'm mm -hmm. sure, at one point or another lives is, you, you found out that you, you, you couldn't find that happiness. You couldn't make that happiness on your own. There was something still lacking no matter what you were trying. Yeah, absolutely. And we go through life and you, you're working in a college, you probably see these challenges a lot. Is it a lot of young adults, they, a lot of us grow up and they go through that time period of, I've got to find what makes me happy. I've got to find the security and the protection and so forth. And so often we are directed with this conveyor belt sort of system that it's somewhere in the world. You go to college, you get a degree, you get a good job, you have lots of money, get a retirement, get a yacht, an RV, drive around the country, make pilgrimages to eat a BTN on the way, sometimes. <laughs> um, but that that's kind of where our sense of security and happiness is yeah. at. And it always falls short. Yeah. And Doug, uh, you know, college life is so crucial. I mean, it's that, it's that time in their lives that they're, they're making their, those decisions. They're, and if, if they're not having, they don't have that foundation, um, it's very difficult. Um, it, it, it can be a, a period of, of despair at times. Which is why your, your presence in a, on a college campus is so important, especially even the visual presence even as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. To be a provocation, college students need a space. All adults need a space in their lives to be the least bit reflective. If, if, if you're uh, plugged in all the time, if you're uh, running around busy with everything in your life, there is no moment to judge what you're experiencing, to make a real judgment. Is this satisfying? Does this really touch down to my depths? Um, that's what it takes. Um, uh, August, St. Augustine says, the heart is restless until it rests in Christ, but if you don't get to your heart, there's no awareness of that. Um, Good point. Yeah. We're gonna do a break here and come back. We got much more with these, uh, these fine gentlemen from Atchison, Kansas. Don't go away, back after this. Welcome back to Life on the Rock. Doug Bear here, co-hosting with Father Mark Mary, Rock House Compadres. We're thankful you're with us, and we have with us three wonderful gentlemen from Atchison, Kansas, Benedictine Monastery, and you are also deeply entrenched and involved in the lives of those men and women at Benedictine College. And we talked just before we went to the break about the importance of being visible, being around there, letting them see you and, 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 and be engaged with this more than just individuals who have ideas and philosophy and prayer and this is this is a history this is 
giants who've gone before. You know, before the show, you talked about, you know, Abbot, you talked about St. Boniface in Germany. We talked about Benedict himself and, and the bread and, and the cup of wine. I mean, that's 1,500 years approximately back to Benedict's time. And it's just phenomenal to know that, that we have this type of religious order in a presence, you're giving your presence in this, this life for these, these, these college students. Talk a little bit, if you could, about Benedict and college um, in general, uh, why it's important to have uh, you know, good Catholic colleges, especially now. Sure, I mean, the reason we're here in the United States as Benedictines, um, we came over from Germany to found colleges. And so from, from that day um, early on, almost 160 years ago, that's been our focus is education. Mm -hmm. And the importance of bringing uh, Catholic education, spe specifically at the, the university level, um, is so key in, in helping form these students, their lives. They're, they're asking the tough questions at this time in their life. They're going through the, the, the points in their life where they're maturing the most. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's at that point when we can really uh, get them to ask those tough questions, get them to um, really focus in on what it means to develop that relationship <coughs> with Christ. Mm -hmm. And so in the university setting in, at Bennington College, um, from you know, student life to um, the classroom, we really have the opportunity to meet these students at a, at, a, at, a, at a place where most don't have the opportunity. There's, there's a familiarity there that um, they're able to open up to us in ways that, that they might not others, um, right. developing that re relationship with them. And, and not every college student who comes to Benedict and, or any Catholic college is, is coming with a rock solid faith, are they? Mm -hmm. You know. No, no, it's really, you, you see conversion stories, um, right, opportunities so. of, of growth. Um, Brother Levin in the last yes, segment, he absolutely. mentioned that he himself is one of those, those stories <laughs> yeah. um, of, of coming to Bennington College um, for, either, uh, for various reasons mm -hmm. and, and really encountering Christ um, through the life there, the, the common life of, uh, within the residence halls, um, in, in the liturgies, um, interacting with the monks, the professors, um, it really is the importance of, of forming community, um, and I think as St. Benedict envisioned it, to, to help us grow closer to Christ, to help us develop that relationship. And, and it's fortuitous that we're, we're doing this. Uh, when we first came to America, uh, we founded the university to train priests, uh, German immigrants on the frontiers of Kansas. What did they not have? They didn't have the sacraments. And I about mean, what year were that? Have been? 1850s. Okay. So when we came, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was a bishop and two other priests in the diocese from Leavenworth to the Colorado Rockies all the way up to Minnesota. That's what we came to. So we needed priests, so we founded a, a seminary, a university and a seminary to train priests. Nowadays, uh, the church is facing a problem with retaining young people in their faith. Uh, Benedictine College is a great place for young people to come and ask questions about what they truly desire and to find a, uh, uh, an environment supportive of the faith. Right. right there. Could you all talk about the community life of the students? Is it a household system or focus is there or what, yeah. what is yeah. there? Would the uh, college really through the ministry of Benedictine College and the student life office really focuses on really integrating the spiritual life into all aspects. So the dormitories, uh, the orientation, uh, student life focus came to Benedictine College. We were the first campus to have focus. In 1998, we had Curtis Martin come out and give a talk. And uh, from there it began, and that we, so we were sort of the flagship college of and focus. And you saw him on Mother Angelica's show. That's right. right. That's About, it's funny because in April of 97, I was watching EWTN and Curtis Martin and Scott Hahn were on Mother Angelica and they were talking about uh, this new program they were starting, but they really hadn't started it yet. So I called right away after the show, and they said, call 1-800-MY-FAITH, which was the Catholic United for the Faith office. And I called, and I didn't hear anything. It was April, May, June, July, mm -hmm. August. But God has a mysterious way because he didn't send a pamphlet, but he sent a person, because that fall, Ted Shree came to mm -hmm. teach at Benedictine. And I asked him if he was aware of focus. And, and uh, so right away we began to work in... That was in the fall of, of 97, and in 98 we had the first focus gathering and meeting at Benedictine. Mm -hmm. And so it was a wonderful event for us. Mm -hmm. Now, we, oh, we know we got a couple of videos we want to get to as well tonight. We got one coming up here now. Um, Ab and James, what is it we're going to see? I hear this is um, not your standard operating. No, it's not, not, not typical. You know, um, monk video. I, I do approve it, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's borderline. No, really, it, it's, a, it's a good video. Um, really focusing on, on diff different works that the monks do, okay. um, from teaching in the college to the manual labor we do around the monastery. Um, just the various uh, ways showing to young people 
um, that, our, that our lives aren't stodgy. Um, that we do really do have um, joy in our lives, and I think this video shows that. That you don't um, just walk around singing chant all the that's time. That's right, that's right. Okay. Although that, it might come across that way in the video. Okay, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. all right, there you go. So. Okay, all right, everybody, uh, take a look at this video. Hi, my name is Father Roderick Giller. I'm a monk of St. Benedict's Abbey. Sometimes people ask me, what does a monk do all day? We get in chapel four times a day to pray and to celebrate the Eucharist. It takes many jobs in the monastery for things to run smoothly. I'm the director of transportation, which means I'm the driver. I'm Brother Levin Harton, and I'm the Director of Vocations for the Abbey, and I want you to consider a monastic vocation. I'm Brother Emmanuel, and I'm a professor at Benedictine College. I'm a professor. I'm also the Assistant Vocations Director, which means I pretty much do all of this guy's work. Hey. It took a little getting used to to have a monk as a teacher. You divide by seven, what does X equal? X equals two. Very good. Math class is over. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. I'm Father Maurice Hapling, and I'm all business. I'm Abbot Barnabas Seneca, and for 18 and a half years I was the superior in the monastery, and now I have a boss. I'm Prior Jeremy Hepler. I coordinate the calendars and the day-to-day -day operations around the Abbey. Which means I really don't have any idea what's going on around here. Hey, my name's Brother Luke Turner, and after 25 years, the Abbots decided to send me back to school. Hi, I'm Brother Joe. I am the Mel Monk, and I do speedy delivery. Me, me. I'm Abbot Ralph Taylor, and all I have to do now is to keep the young monks in line. I'm Abbot James Albers, and I'm proud to be the father of this community. Uh, okay, Abbot the man, the man, right here sitting by us. Um, okay, so now, whose idea was this? Um, I think it was just a collaboration of several monks um, okay. trying to uh, show to various individuals what, what we do and try to um, just uh, be humorous in the yeah. process. Right. We, we the process. also have an e excellent uh, worker at our uh, advancement office at the Abbey. His name's J.D. Benning. He does great video work. He, uh, he was the one who put, put that together after the initial kernel idea um, and came up with a lot of the script too. And was everybody on that video okay with their role? I, I think so. We haven't heard any complaints anyway. So, so you all sit around talking, you know, at meals, you know, why did I get to be the enforcer? I should be the finance. I'm the finance. Ab Abbot just... Ralph actually fits that role pretty well. Oh, that's, that's okay. That's pretty well, a, he was the abbot. He always says it was a big mistake accepting you. He, when he, took, put the, he gave me the habit 29 years ago, so he's always joking with us. So <laughs> you have to understand Abbot Ralph. So he just caught a 17 pound catfish, so he's very happy. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's content right now. Awesome. Is he going to stuff it and mount it on the, uh, so. on the priory wall there? Um, so w w how many students do you have at Benedictine College that you interact with? We have 1,800 right now, which okay. is up from the early 90s when she was, was about 590. Mm -hmm. But again, the college really began to focus on the uh, Catholic identity, the mission of the school, mm -hmm. being Catholic, Benedictine, liberal arts, and residential. And so that's, since that began to happen, you know, focus is there. We have uh, community liberation. We have a Memorist Domini house on campus. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a lot of students from other movements in the church. Uh, everyone from people who went through the Latin mass to the charismatic renewal. So, but the common thread is that they love Jesus. And uh, the pro-life movement, Abbot James and Archbishop Keller, or Ar Archbishop Nauman 
and our students led the March for Life this year. Hmm. And then there was a picture earlier with Abbot James consecrating the campus to Mary. So I think that's a wonderful thing is that just reinforcing the mission of the college. I think it really is beautiful the, the, of what's happening there, you know, the various groups. Um, the, the, it really is showing the universality of the church mm -hmm. and the body of Christ that is the church. It's, it's beautiful just to see the interaction of the different groups, the different uh, charisms that, are, that, are, that have come to uh, make their home at Benedictine um, and, and us having welcomed them. And it's just, it's just a beautiful thing to see. Yeah, th there's uh, a diversity of orthodoxy there, a plurality of, of movements uh, that emphasizes the um, unpredictable and uh, beautiful, diverse nature of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of many different individuals who, you know, follow the church. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a real strength of the college that there's such a diversity of, of orthodoxy there. Yeah, it makes me think a little bit, Father Mark and I had talked um, when we uh, did the show right around Pentecost, that, you know, that day when the tongues of fire rested on these men and the doors burst open and now their, their fear and their timidity was gone and they went out into the streets you know, accused of being drunk on wine and the whole nine yards, and there they were out there speaking different languages. And I love the different language part because it shows that the Holy Spirit inspires different mm -hmm. languages given to these men, and that languages are not just what you speak audibly from the mouth, but it's, 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 it's the way we present the faith. As long as it's faithful to the church, true to Rome, and so forth, then, um, you know, the variation that is, is you're talking about, the variety of approaches that the Holy Spirit can bring. And we all have our, our different languages at times. And I think the importance of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that St. Benedict is known for his chapter on humility, where he talks a lot about, you know, keeping your head down, not laughing too much, and having a seriousness about life. But people often miss the very end of that, because at the very end of it, he says, when we arrive at the height of humility, then love replaces fear. And we live no longer out of a dread, but we live out of a love. Out, and he said, all of this is done by the Holy Spirit. And it's one of my favorite passages, the very end of chapter 7, because he said the Holy Spirit sort of burns away that fear and replaces it with love, which is a love of God, a love of our mm -hmm. destiny, a love of Christ, a love of what our mission in the world, which is so different from going around. It's just sort of fearful, which was what the disciples were before they had encountered the Holy right. Spirit. Now, St. Benedict obviously had a pretty popular um, saint that we've had 16 popes now take his name. Um, now, the recent, Benedict XVI, spoke about his patron recently. I know one of you was speaking about this yes. before the show. Um, well, one of the things that he said was that St. Benedict, uh, after World War II, Pope Pius XII wrote an encyclical saying that Benedict, he contrasted Benedict with Hitler and Stalin and Benedict built up Europe, he built up culture. Mm -hmm. And then Paul VI in 1964 during Vatican II, he en emphasized the fact that St. Benedict brought three things to the world. He brought the cross, which is the saving event of Jesus, the book, which is learning, and the plow, which is of course agriculture. And so the monks were not just isolated on a mountaintop somewhere, but they were involved with the building of Europe. And so mm -hmm. that was so key to what Paul VI understood, and also what Pope Benedict XVI. So I think that's one of the reasons he took Benedict, because he said we need to have that re-evangelization, mm -hmm. that new evangelization of the world that St. That Benedict brought in his own day. Yeah. And cities would actually grow up around monasteries, right? That and you see the phenomenon, yeah. like even with the Franciscans at EWTN, we were talking about that, you know, that people who move here or to Hansville right, or, right. you know, because there, there's, they see, you know, monasteries or religious life, that, that movement in the church, I think is so important. Yeah. But we're seeing, we're seeing families move to Atchison because uh -huh. of the culture that is there. Um, they desire that, you know, they're able to work out of their homes because of technology, and so they're yeah. moving their families to Atchison. And, it's 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 an incredible thing to see. Tell us about the charism of stability, Abbott. I know you all have mentioned it uh, several times. Yeah, stability. Um, a lot of people kind of think of that as that we're in the monastery and, and we're not to get out and about. And but it really is um, a sense of of stabilizing stabilizing ourselves in Christ and really um, seeing our lives as kind of a, an opportunity for others to gather around. Mm -hmm. um, if we're stable, if, we, if we're anchored in Christ in this place, in this monastery, we're an autonomous monastery, meaning this is, this is our home. We, our vow of stability is to this place. If we're anchored here in Christ, then that gives others opportunity to, to, to seek out Christ. They know where to find us. Um, we know where we're gonna be the rest of our lives. We're gonna be buried up the hill 400 yards <laughs> when we die. 
Um, but you know, the charism also allows for, for that, that sense of being able to, um, to engage the world. So it's not, it's not uh, closing in ourselves, but it's, it's anchoring ourselves in Christ so that we can then engage the world. Right. Um, and, and, bring and how Christ our culture that. needs these seeds of stability, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. This, the devout stability adds, in, in, my, in my opinion, a, a real depth and a real uniqueness to the fraternal life. Um, uh, there, there are many other orders, and I think they, they, they have beautiful gifts, but one of our beautiful gifts, I believe, is, is this vow of stability that means that uh, for the rest of my life, I'll be with Abbot James, I'll be with Father Meinrad. Um, I won't be with my brothers in, a, in an abstract way, but with the particular individuals um, th that, I, that, that I have joined in the beginning. Um, uh, the type of relationship that develops in that context it does have differences from if I'm going to be around for five years in, on an assignment and then move to another assignment. Um, and there are, there are benefits to both, but I think it's something that makes it distinct and it creates uh, the opportunity to go, to go deep and, and, and really have some honesty and sobriety in, in, in the relationship and in the growth of the spiritual life. Um, yeah. We're going to run to a break right now, and when we get back, we have one more video uh, about the Benedict and uh, Monastery, and uh, you're going to get a chance to see it if you don't go away. Back after this. <laughs> Welcome back to Life on the Rock. This is our last segment with these, with these amazing men. And I, and I say that because I, I truly mean that there is such a need for us to see the visual. I, was, I love when, when Father Mark and I are out publicly, you know, at different events and, and traveling around. You know, it's, it's one thing when you're in, in Rio World Youth Day or Madrid, and there's a lot of priests out there. But when we're just out getting something neat after the show somewhere, and, and he's in his habit, it says something to the world. It says something. And here we have these, these three monks from the Benedictine Abbey down in, in uh, Atchison, Kansas. And, and you make a presence known that the Catholic Church is not going away, no matter what is being thrown at us. And I'm fired up on this, I suppose, because, you know, we are living in a tough time. Benedict fought it at his time. You know, Pope Benedict XVI, the Emeritus, has recently, you know, um, you know, in recent years, reminded us of the need for, as you said during the break there, Father Manrit, mm -hmm. of a new Benedict, of, of, of new voices, because our times have their challenges today, just as they did at the time of Rome. And, well, and, well, I, and I just feel for so many families, businesses, and I hear this from people that, uh, you know, that, you know, like the HHS mandate, marriage, all these things, and so many people feel squeezed, mm -hmm. and I think that, but in, in Benedict's day, it, there was a lot of the same sort of, I don't know, the, uh, sort of lost in the wilderness mentality. But I think Benedict f continued to focus on Christ, that, that that has to be what's brought to the world, this, right. this encounter with Christ, which oftentimes Christ was forgotten. I think that's where we get into this situation to begin with, because we forget who Christ is, that he's alive, that he is alive. And when that happens, one of the heroes, and it's funny because this is going to be, uh, this is St. Benedict Day, and on this day in 1980, on the 1500th birthday of St. Benedict, uh, Monsignor Luigi Giussani, who founded Communion Liberation, went to Monte Cassino, and he went there on the 1500th birthday of St. Benedict, and he took with him lay people, and he started the movement Communion Liberation there as an official movement. Mm -hmm. And a lot of bishops said, well, the abbot of Monte Cassino couldn't recognize that. So Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II said, well, I will recognize it. <laughs> so two years later, on the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, uh, St. John Paul II recognized communion liberation. But I think these movements, Opus Dei, communion liberation, so many of these movements are what's needed for people not to give up the fight, but to stay supporting mm -hmm. one another. And that's what the Abbey, I think the St. Benedict's Abbey, the college does, is we become a fortress where we bring the gospel of Jesus to people in a very forceful way, our Catholic faith in a forceful way. Right, right. Future saints, yeah. future potential, future martyrs even, you know, That's right. be it they, they every, white every, or red martyrs. Yeah, I mean, every, every age we have to be ready for yeah, that. Yeah, we have to because as Tertullian said, it's the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church and the generations to come are counting on us today. They're counting on our, on our fighting spirit, our, our spiritual 
you know, tenacity sure. to not give up. I like what you said about uh, Benedictine's making a statement, monastic orders making a statement that we're not going away. I think on the show we've had a couple pictures of our, of our physical structure, our abbey. Mm -hmm. I mean, how deep does the foundation go down? That's 20 feet, 30 feet in underground? I mean, we're not going anywhere. Um, and that's a particular contribution that monastic orders can make because they, they, they do build for a stable location, one location. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not there for an apostle, they're there for their life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a particular, like, like you said, a, just a unique witness that we do make right. um, to the culture. And you're always looking to uh, uh, recruit, we meaning are. knocking on hearts by the grace of God, see if other men are called to this, uh, this, this life. Mm -hmm. uh, Abbot James, we're about to see a video how can you set it up for us? This is your, sure. a little bit different than the first one we saw. Sure, and so, um, you know, most vocations are born out of, out of a relationship, out yeah. of an encounter, um, an encounter with Christ, someone uh, bringing Christ to us, or, um, you know, from a pastor to a, a fellow uh, monk, or whatever it is. And so this video is really gonna show us um, how that encounter with Christ um, is called, calls us out to bring Christ to others, to, um, in Pope Francis's words, to wake up the world. Mm -hmm. um, that that um, as religious, we have something to contribute to the world that nothing, no one else is offering. And um, I think this video captures that, that very well. Excellent, all right. Take a look at this wonderful video about the order of the Benedictines. I've been I've wounded been by Christ's by love. love. I found peace up here. The monastic life was a surprise to me. The human heart stirs with a hope that it did not give itself. From its depths comes an appeal to cry out to him who made it. The monastic life is centered on a response to that desire a rhythm of prayer St. Benedict calls the Opus Dei, the work of God. When I came to the monastery, I was seeking a balance uh, between work and prayer and other parts of my life. I was seeking a real place and encountering a community that had been here for 150 years was very much attractive. Grounded in prayer, the monks of St. Benedict's Abbey are called forward to be a provocation to a sleeping world. The, the idea that I could be called to this was completely new when I came to St. Benedict's Abbey, when I came to the, the community. My sophomore year, I began to pray for some of my life, I think, that I ever actually sat down and prayed as if there was someone waiting to speak with me. And having that encounter with Christ in prayer, it changed everything in my life. Everything changed. In their labor, they bring forth the divine light of Christ to God's people. They are teachers, spiritual fathers, chaplains, missionaries heralding the new evangelization. We live in such a way that other people can see the peacefulness that we have, the joy that we have in, in living this life, and hopefully it might wake up enough young men to come and join us. The monks encounter Christ in the flesh by sharing their lives. I was so moved by the discovery that I was loved by someone infinite who cared for me, who provided me with everything I needed to be happy, that I, I just wanted to be where, where I saw Jesus, and, and that happened to be here. Running this path together, each brother is promised a transformation, conversion that leads his heart to overflow with the inexpressible delight of love. Uh, and really, really gets to the heart of it. Um, I just, real quick, I know Father Mark something he wants to throw in here, but I just want to say this: that joy, joy is talked about, and joy is so misunderstood in our world. Joy, oftentimes, is translated as to I'm having fun, I'm having a good time, and I'm happy. Therefore, 
you know, you're talking about something that God has created for the heart, a deeper, more interior joy that is about a peace of being with the one that we are created for. Father Mark. I just, uh, Brother, Brother Levin has got some material on discernment here for us. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, well, our, our, our vocations office is putting out new materials um, these days. And one of the things that we're uh, uh, working hard on is a little uh, a discernment publication called Obskulta. And we envision it as being something that is um, not just for people to discern in our life, but just discernment in general. So um, it's uh, going to be a quarterly publication. Um, it's something that you can sign up online and get digitally, or we can uh, mail it to you as well. And uh, our, our website, kansasmonks.org, kansasmonks.org, uh, has that sign up on the vocations page. And again, it's a wonderful uh, little, little discernment tool. There's six points of how to discern your vocation right there. Uh, there's a message from me, which may be the worst part of the publication. <laughs> <laughs> but it's laid out very attractively, and it's a really nice thing, and we do it for free. So please take advantage of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Abba James, uh, 30 seconds for you to any final parting shots to the world. <laughs> well, this is, um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And um, it is an incredible life um, to live as brothers in, in the monastery. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really being able to be an example of that relationship with Christ to the world, to, to share Christ with others, um, and to be a, a very distinct part of people's lives, mm. um, touching their, their hearts, their lives in ways um, that I wouldn't have been able to do if I wasn't in the monastery. Mm. Um, to bring, be able to bring Christ to them in spiritual direction through the sacraments and to see their lives changed in that, it, it's really an incredible thing. And the lives of them and the lives of generations to come. Yeah, gentlemen, thank, thank you so thank much you. for your time. Fantastic, great to have you on the show. Thank you, Brother Levin. Mm. Father Mark, it's only you can do. And if the, well, if the priest could join me too. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week.